Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. I'm so blessed we have a growing number here in um, live service. And uh, thank you, Zoomers. Thank you, those who are watching at YouTube. We are very thankful unto God for your faithfulness that even in this virtual, you are worshiping with us. And um, basically, we are continuing our series of knowing the God of the Bible. And for today, we will be discussing one of the incommunicable attributes of God, and that he is omniscience. Did you know that um, I grew up as a religious people, I mean person, and uh, I tend to pray to a particular person, uh, specifically Mama Mary. But then when I encountered this teaching, suddenly I was able to go out of that idolatrous prayer. You know, the, especially, I mean, this topic and that lap topic last week, you remember that God is omnipresent, that he is uh, present everywhere at the same time. And now we are talking about the omniscience of God, that he knows all things. You know, uh, it's easy for me. I mean, it was so easy for me to go out of that idolatrous kind of prayer because, you know, I realized that um, if I pray to Mary, let's say I am in the Philippines, and then along that time, one, one person is also praying in America, and then someone is praying in Saudi Arabia, then someone is praying in Europe, and we are praying all together. Then it means that Mary is all-seeing, all-knowing, and that he is all-present. But I'm telling you, these attributes, it is only unto God. He will not able to share these attributes, or else there will be so many gods. And, uh, and it's easy for me, and I, I really praise for that, that God allow me to encounter the, the truth. And I really pray that many people would also encounter that, that truth, that there's only one God, that there's only one all-knowing God, that there's only one omnipotent God, that is Jesus. Shall we pray? Father God, we just want to thank you at this moment. I recognize that I am not an eloquent speaker and that this is not my first language. But I believe, Lord, the power comes from you. Lord, for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of these people around here, let this message be powerful. Make this a life-changing so that, Lord God, we, 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 as we go out in this place, there will be a sense of security, a sense of assurance that no matter who we are, you still accept us. As you see the inmost thoughts of us, our deeds, our words, oh God, Lord, I thank you. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. You know, um, many years ago, little Johnny... Sylvester was kicked in the head by a horse, and the doctor said, soon, he will not be making it. And as a little child, he's making his last wish, last wish, and that he told his last wish to his father, and I quote, I wish I could see Babe Ruth, you know, the famous uh, baseball player during that time in America, I wish I could see Babe Ruth hit, hit a hammer, Homer, <laughs> before I die. And then the father sent a telegraph to the New York Yankees in, Louis, uh, in St. Louis where they will be playing with the Cardinals in the 1926 World Series. And then after several days, a, I mean, uh, a response came. Johnny, this little guy, received autograph balls, the baseballs. And those were autographed by the Yankees players and the Cardinal players. And one of that balls is... Um, signed by his favorite player, Babe Ruth. And he said, along with that, the inscription, it says, I'll hit a home run for you in Wednesday's game. So basically, when this child saw that ball, I mean, written by his favorite player, he was elated in courage. And uh, at the actual date, instead of hitting one home run, you know, Babe Ruth was able to hit three home runs. And the boy was <laughs> ecstatic and he was encouraged. And because of that, the doctors called the effect on the boy's condition a miracle. So basically, the life of the boy was extended. And some months later, the uncle of the boy came unto 
um, and to uh, Ruth, you know, Babe Ruth approached him and thanked him greatly because of what he did. And Babe Ruth just smiled and said, you're very welcome. And then the uncle moved away from his presence. And then this Babe Ruth, uh, as he's surrounded by the reporters, he asked, who in the blankety blank is Johnny Sylvester? You know, just previously he, he was writing a letter and now he forgot who is this little kid. But praise God, God will not forget us. All of our prayers, all of our names, he will never, never forget us. You know, today we will be learning about the omnipresence, omni, omni, um, omniscience of God, as we have discussed last week about the omnipresence of God. The omnipresence of God is that He is everywhere present at the same time. And this morning, we will be discussing about the omniscience of God, meaning that He is an all-knowing God. And in classical biblical theology, the doctrine of omnipotence uh, God's omni omniscience, it means that God knows all things, past, present, and future, the real and the potential, and He knows them all at the same time. Amazing, isn't it? You know, He, know, he not only knows what's in the past, and that He also knows what was, what is, and what it will be, but on top of that, He knows everything that could be, but is not. Meaning that God knows all the probabilities that would happen in the future. God knows all the possibilities that will happen in the future. God has seen those possible things, but are not. Amazing, isn't it? He, and you know what? But the, but the amazing thing is that he sees the past, he sees the present, and he sees the future, and even the unseen future, and he sees them in one sitting. Woo! At the same time, all together. You know, brothers and sisters, this is an amazing attribute of God. He alone has these attributes. And there are few doctrines that taught in Scripture as that of God's omniscience. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 3, the Lord is a God who knows. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, God knows everything. In Psalms 147, verse 5, great is our Lord. His understanding has no limits. And Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Brothers and sisters, I love the word keeping watch. It means continuously. Not only that he is watching over us, but he's watching over us continuously and that not only us, but even the wicked. I'm telling you, church, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God knows everything. God knows everything. Everything possible. Every possibility he knows. Everything that is actual. All events. All creatures in the past, in the present, and in the future, his knowledge is absolute, innate, real, complete, full, and free. God's knowledge is but utterly perfect. He knows no things better than other, any other thing, but all things are equally well. You know, I'm telling you, he will never discover anything. He will not be surprised of anything, meaning he will not be surprised if you commit sin. He will not be surprised if you terminated in your workplace. He will not be surprised because he had seen it as it is, and he will never be amazed of anything, and he will never wonder of anything, and that he will never question of something because everything is plain into his eyes. You know, he knows everything, and he knows everything and how to fit everything. That's why... That's why the Bible says he, God works everything for good because he has seen everything and he will fit everything together for our good and for his glory. That's what we are going to talk this morning. There is no one who knows us thoroughly than the God of the universe. There is no one who accepts us more completely than the omniscient God. Why did I say that? Because number one, God knows us completely. 
God knows us completely. You know, in the text that we have read a while ago, it was mentioned in Psalms 139, verses 1 to 6, as I read, You have searched me, O Lord, and know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You discern, you know, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. In verse 4, it says, Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in and behind and before, and, you're, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. You know, this is the first truth of Psalms 139. God know us completely. No one can know us more completely than the God of the universe. And basically, David is saying in an amplified version, version he's saying, God, you know me completely. You made a detailed inquiry into my life. You know all my actions, all my words, all my thoughts, and not only know what I have done, you know why I did it, you know it all. Psalms 139 verse 1 says that God knows us because he searches us. That's why he said, O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. The word search here in Hebrew means to examine carefully or to explore. It can apply to a burglar looking for a precious possessions, valuable possession. And also the word, uh, the word carries with it the idea of digging or scurrying. David is saying that God knows him penetratingly because God has scored and ransacked every detail of his life. And because he carefully examined us, he knows us. He knows each one of us. And what is the impact of that? What does God know about us? What does God know about us? The first one is he knows what we do. It says in verse one, uh, verse 1, verse 2, you know when I sit and when I rise. God knows when we sit and God knows when we are rising up. And he knows when we plop into that lazy boy and when we get up to get some more cheese and nachos. And that, you know, this rising up and sitting down, they are complete opposite because it connotes the whole action of us throughout the day. Basically, God knows what happened throughout the day. And Proverbs 5, chapter 21 says, For a man's ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all his paths. Church, I'm telling you, God knows every move that we are making. God knows, and he's with you, sitting with you when you scroll down your laptop, your mobile, and he's watching with you whatever you are watching right now. Not only that God knows what we are doing, God knows what we are thinking. He said, you perceive my thoughts from afar. It's amazing and sometimes difficult to comprehend, but God knows what we think before we say it. No, it's just in our pigment of imagination or just in our mind, but God knows it. And I remember when we are still dating with my, my wife, we are single then, we are just engaged, and I'm trying to take his hands. And I told her, is it okay? What, what is your thought about it? And uh, I want her to reveal what her thoughts about I holding her hands, and every time we are going out, I'll be asking her. And uh, you know, then I realized that looking back, I am insecure because why I am asking God, asking that question to reveal her thoughts of what I am doing. You know, basically, I wanted to make sure that she was not thinking bad things about me. That's why I keep asking him, uh, asking her. Friends, I'm telling you, God knows everything about you, but he still loves you. 
God knows everything about you and He still accepts you. And Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. He knows what we do. He knows what we think. And He knows where we are going. It says, you discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. God knows your routine. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? God knows what will you do later on. And that word is, the word discern, it means to sit or we know as a grain. God knows where we go because He can see everything very clearly and He can discern everything. He sifts through our lives and understanding what is really going on and he immediately comprehend the good things and the bad things that we are making, that we are doing from the time that we stumble out of the bed until to the point that we will go collapse into the bed at night. He sees it all. And when we think, brothers and sisters, of making an escape, you know what? No, no, no. Just like what we have learned from last week, we can hide, but he would be there. Uh, he's always with us, no matter where we go. And also, he knows what we're going to say. The verse is powerful. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You know, if you are like me, you often, I mean, you often don't know what you are going to say until you say it. And sometimes our... I mean, our mouth cannot process what's in our mind, correct? And sometimes we cannot thoroughly express what's in our mind. I mean, we become limited. Sometimes we say things uh, that you did not meant it because you are not able to really process that. Mga kapatid, I'm telling you, kapatid, I'm telling you, God does not only hear everything that we say, He knows what we are going to say. He knows it and that's why, mga kapatid, sometimes when we falter, sometimes when we are not able to express it completely, he understands it very well. Because before you say it, he already knows it. Hallelujah. He knows what we are going to say before that, that words be formed in our mouth and be released out of our mouth. Sometimes, you know, the thoughts are like a word to God. Our thoughts. Those unspoken thoughts, they are words upon God. I mean, he he's able to hear it like we are speaking and shouting from the rooftop. Meaning that our thoughts are shout unto God. Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And the next one is that he knows what we need. Hallelujah! I love this. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid... Your hand upon me. And David here is using the imagery of war. He was, as a commander, as a soldier, he knows, and he knows all about the strategic battle plan, the ambushes, and how to surround the city. And basically, he's using this, and he felt trapped by God's knowledge of his every thought. He was as if he is surrounded all by God. And he knew he knew that reality that he is surrounded by God. He cannot turn back because God is also there. And he cannot go in front of him because God is already in front of him. And his hands keep David from harm. You know, basically, the Bible is telling us and David is stating a fact that God knows everything about us, what we need what we are going to do, what we are going to say, the thoughts in our minds, and even every action. And you know, how did David responded from such great realities? How did he responded? You know what? As he ponders the fact that God knows him completely, you know what? He is blown away. He is blown away. Why? He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me. To attain. 
Hallelujah. You know what? He cannot even begin to understand and less and much less describe the depth of God's personal knowledge of his every action, of his every thoughts, of every words, of every intent, of every need. You know, the word wonderful in the original Greek word is placed at the beginning of the sentence and it should be read like this. Wonderful is God's knowledge. Hallelujah. Wonderful is God's knowledge and it is too lofty for me to even understand or even imagine. Brothers and sisters, when we try to understand the greatness of God, there is only one response, just like how David responded, and that we will become overwhelmed. And once we become overwhelmed, there will be wonders and worship as a response unto God. Wonders and worship are always the proper response when we see the greatness of God. Amazement should lead us to awe, and awe should lead us to, 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 to adore God and to worship the Lord because He knows us. Completely, And the second truth is that God thinks of us constantly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says in the text, How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. When I count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. I love that last phrase. When I am awake, I am still with you. You know, when you awake here on earth, you are still with God. When you awake in heaven, you will be with God forever. Whether, whether I mean, in every place that you will be waking up, whether here on earth, earth or in heaven, you will be with God. You know, not only does God know us completely, but God thinks of us constantly. He knows everything about us, and yet, and behold, though He knows everything about us, He loves us and is still like us. We are known, and our knowable, holy, creative, and ever-present God still accepts us. He sees the entire life from the very beginning, even before we start to grow in the womb of our mother. He knows all about our sin and all about moral compromise. And yet, and behold, his heart is speak on, is, speaks on us and he thinks about us all the time. I'm telling you, church, God knows what you have done. God knows what sin you have done and what sins you are committing and even the sins that you will continue to commit in the future. And he said, you will do it again, you will do it again, you will do it again. But he would respond in love. He would respond in forgiveness. Never, he said, never I will leave you. Never I will forsake you. You know, for us, when we are close to one person, at the beginning, we are so intimate, they are acceptable. But when, we real, but when they realize that, mm, mm, you did this, oh, you are like this, then you know what will happen? They move away from us, correct? I know you, you have met such kind of person, but God... No, 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 with God. The more he knows us, the more he accepts us. And the more he knows us, the more he will conform us. No, the more he will conform us to his own image. Hallelujah. That's why the, the, not only that God is constantly think of us, you know, I'm telling you, God's thoughts for us are precious. I love that song. No, uh, there's a song that comes into my mind. For your thoughts towards me are holy, full of love and grace. I don't know if you know that song. But this is the reality. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. You know, David is overwhelmed as he contemplates the greatness of God. He doesn't understand how God could think of him sinner as he was, and he could think of him all the time. The word precious refers to expensive jewel. You know, David treasures the realization that God knows him, that God accepts him, that God is thinking about him in every second of the day, and he's so involved with him even in our lives that we can even begin to fathom how many times would God be thinking of us. Have you? Ponder upon that. How many times 
would God be thinking about us? And that is our second thought, second point. God's thoughts are numerous. It says here, where I, uh, where, where can I count to them, they would outnumber the grains of sun. You know, brothers and sisters, when we try to count them, I'm telling you, it would outnumber the grains of the sun of all the beaches in the entire world. And have you tried to count a grains in a pail, a small pail, or even in a can? Have you tried to count them one by one? I, I doubt have you done that. But God is telling us, if you count that one, I, how much, if you cannot count that small pail, how much more you can count the, all the grains in the beaches. Brothers and sisters, God's thoughts of us are innumerable, impossible to count, and impossible to understand. You know, sometimes one of the nicest things the husband can say to his wife, he called his wife and said, Oh, I thought of you all day. And sometimes the wife would, oh, really? And uh, he would just be, uh, English ng kilig, and he just be, wow, he, he felt that love. But, you know, if you think of it closely, when that husband mentioned, I thought of you all day, it's somewhat like a, uh, as a bola, I don't know in English, no? It's like a, uh, not true, because how can a husband think of his wife all throughout the day? He will not be working. He will not be taking a bath. He will not be going to a friend. He will not be in the transport. He will not be moving around. You know what? It's, it's good to say that and it's good to be heard hearing that. But the reality, it is not true. But, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but, the, but not so with God. He think about us all the time. All the time. You know what? If you were to calculate you know, the how many times God is think of, thinking of you, I'm telling you, your computer and your calculator would hang up because it cannot be able to measure the times that God would think of us. You know, because David is comparing the thoughts of God, how many times he's thinking of him with the numbers of the grains of sand on the beach. Praise the Lord. Not only that they are precious, not only that they are numerous, but also they are constant. That's why it says, when I, when I awake, I am still with you. And God does not forget us even when we are sleeping. We thought that if we are asleep, then God move away and go to other person so that he can minister to other person. You know, that's the thought that we had. But I'm telling you, in verse, in Psalms uh, 121, verse 3 to 4, it says, He will not let your foot slip. He who, watch, he who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Even when you're sleeping, God is not sleeping. Never in a moment that He takes His eyes off of us. And constantly, He is with us, looking upon us, beside us, mga kapatid. No? When David mentioned in verse 1, uh, it says, uh, God, you have searched me and you have known me. Now He's moving to verse 23 and 24 that would lead us to point number 3. God searches us conclusively. That's why the text says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So there are so many verbs there. Uh, it is a request. Search me, know me, test me, and lead me. You know, God knows us completely and think of us constantly. And the final point that I'm trying to make is that God is searching us conclusively. When, when David mentioned that God is searching him in verse 1, he's stating a fact. Remember verse 1? Oh God, you have known me and 
God, you search me and you know me. Now, in verse 23, he is asking God, he's requesting God, and he is pleading to God to, to search him. He's now making it reality, this reality, into a form of prayer. Remember verse 1, Oh God, you have searched me. Now, it says in verse 23, Search me, O God. And basically, that's how he responded. He wants God to invite him. I mean, he's inviting God to search him thoroughly. The verb is the verb search is used um, by a miner to dig up to dig up valuable minerals in a mine. And the term test is used for examining precious metals if they are pure or not. You know, brothers and sisters, let's invite God when we we know that He sees all things. Let us invite him to examine us. You know, sometimes it is good to have a self-analysis, and but then if we are just doing it on our own, I believe it is biased. We will be picky picky on what we will be choosing. And sometimes we said, oh, I'm okay. Still, I'm okay. And we would say, oh, I am better than him. Oh, anyway, I'm good at this. We will be so biased. But then when we ask God, to examine us in the light of his word, in the light of who we are. You know what? (laughs) We would be digging so much. And I mean, the reality of who we are, it just come out because we let God do the examination. So there are four things. If we will be asking God to evaluate ourselves, the first one is search me. It is a prayer. All of me, God, even my darkest secrets and needs. You know, sometimes when we evaluate ourselves, only those good stuff. And we don't want to, I mean, we are moving away or running away from the secret stuff, the hardest part of our life. But when we ask God, Lord, all of me, my secret stuff, my hardest stuff, test me to see if I am pure and true. Tell me, let me know what you found and help me. I love this. Show me how to correct my ways. Lead me the right way. You know, basically, brothers and sisters, when we ask asking God, the end point of that is we are asking him to correct our way for us to be conformed in the image of him. And search me, test me, Tell me, help me. And I believe for some of you, you are doing the Bible Institute. You know what? This is what we call prayer of examen. And I really encourage you to to put this into prayer, asking God to search you, to test you, to tell you, and to help you. You know what, brothers and sisters? Once we understand that God loves us no matter what, we invite his investigation. We welcome his searching. And we desire him to dig into the depths of our being. And we want him to road track, to road test our character. Why? Because it is only God who knows us. Why? Because he knows us better than we know ourselves. And why? Because he loves us too much to allow us to keep doing the things we've been doing. You know, He loves us so much that He will correct us, He will prune us, and He will bring us to another kind of purity and holiness. You know, J.I. Parker said, I am never out of God's mind. I love that. I want to say that again. I am never out of God's mind. There's no moment when His eyes is off of me. His attention distracted me, distracted from me. No, mo- no moment when His care falters. There is a tremendous relief in knowing that his love to me is utterly realistic based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me. I love this. So that no discovery now can disillusion him about me in the way I am so often disillusioned about myself. I love that. He said, no discovery of him can disillusion him. Meaning, he, he would still accept us. He would still love us. You know, sometimes we are disillusioned about ourselves, disappointed with what we are doing. 
we shame ourselves. Why you did that? And we are bitter of the situation that we are in. You know what? We are the solution of so many things about us. But I'm telling you, God is not. He is not the solution by what you are doing. He always responds in love. He always responds in acceptance. He always responds in, in security, in, in bringing us to the person that he has for us. I'm telling you, God is committed for us. He is committed for you to be like him. He is committed that you would be like him in purity and glory. You know, brothers and sisters, because God knows us completely, that he thinks of us constantly, and that he searches us conclusively. You know, I am praying that you don't feel that you are being spied by God. Oh, God is looking for my error. Oh, God. It's like a boss, not like a mother, super. Oh, my boss is here. I have to be very good. You know, brothers and sisters, you don't have to feel that way. You are being looked at so that whatever mistake he, he will discourage you. No, 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 no. But when you know that he knows you completely, let us feel that we are being watched over. Let us feel that we are being secured. Let us feel that we are always accepted by him. Because having placed our confidence in Christ, Christ is in us, correct? And that no skeleton can, out, can come out of us stumbling in that some hidden closet to expose our past and no character flow can come to light that would make God to turn away from us. No, 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 no. If you have so many closets or skeleton brothers and sisters, the same way, God still love you the same. That's why, for God so loved the world. No, and even in Romans, that even while we are still sinners, until now we are still sinners. And what he said? He loves us. 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 You know, brothers and sisters, he already know everything about you. What you have done, what would be your future, thorny as it is, as it will be. Still, he would love you and accept you and that he will conform you to be the person God wants you to be. Shall we pray? Hallelujah. Lord, how precious is your thoughts towards us. Lord, you see our inmost thoughts, our inmost desire. You see, God, when we wake up in the morning, we thought of money, we thought of career, we thought of pleasure. I'm sorry, God, but in a way, God, even you seen that thoughts, that unspoken thoughts, you still accept us, you still correct us, you still transform us. Indeed, Lord, nothing would be able to separate us from the love of God. <laughs> I love that, Lord. Nothing, not my weakness, not my sin, not even my future. Though you have seen me, God, you love me the same. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, ponder upon the love of God as we listen to this song again. He knows you. He loves you. He loves you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, God. Thank you. Respond to Him. Talk to Him. If, you, if there's anything that you need to confess to him right now, say it. Ask him to examine yourself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you listen to this song, talk to him right now. I have a maker before my heart, before even time began, my life was in His hands. He knows. Oh. 
your love towards us and your love God would keep following us that's why David says surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life because I have a father who knows me I have a father who said I will never leave me nor forsake me though you know me God my inward thoughts unspoken words hidden desire and skeleton you still accept me, love me the same. Hallelujah. Receive God's benediction, church. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and that He be gracious unto you. And that His countenance be unto you and that He will give you His peace. Brothers and sisters, go out with joy. The Lord God is with you wherever you go. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen and Amen and Amen.